Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Srini Devadas. I'm a professor of computer science uh, in CSAIL. And uh, Adam said, uh, trust is bad, so we're going to try and minimize it. And I guess I, I also want to say that um, I do have a favorite prime number. It's two, right? And, and if you could use two for all the primes in the world, you know, you, you wouldn't need Adam's code. It, things would go much faster. Um, so uh, what's, uh, what's my talk all about? Uh, we trust a lot uh, when you run things on the cloud, when you think, run uh, anything on your laptop. Uh, there's uh, millions or hundreds of millions of lines of code uh, that you trust that, that's been written by people who are, aren't as good coders as Adam or Franz. Um, and you also trust the hardware, which is billions of gates. All right? And God knows who built that hardware where it was built. So um, there's a lot of trust. And uh, my talk's about how you could shrink the trusted computing base. So that's usually what people say, TCB, uh, when you talk about uh, um, whether uh, computation is correct or not, and what trust is required for the computation to be correct. Um, you could certainly use a, a cryptography uh, to minimize the trusted computing base, and some of you uh, we're here this morning with, in Vinod's talk. Uh, you would have heard about fully homomorphic encryption uh, that um, um, at some level does not require a trusted computing base, at least for privacy. Um, but uh, you do require uh, integrity even if you use uh, cryptography or you know, if you could uh, put together uh, Yale's talk on uh, uh, verifiable computation and Vinod's talk on FHE, then you wouldn't have to trust anything. Uh, but for us mere models who, uh, 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 who run things on uh, regular hardware, um, you have to do uh, essentially what the slide describes, which is trust the OS kernel, trust the hypervisor, uh, trust the hardware. Right? Um, so there have been approaches in the past, in the last past couple of decades, on trying to minimize trust, trying to minimize the trusted computing base. And um, you know, uh, one way uh, was the IBM secure coprocessor approach, which was, well, let's just design everything and put it into a single uh, fabricated unit that has uh, a, kind of a sensor, uh, uh, should I say, a tamper a, a sensing package around it. Um, and, you know, we could put this into a hostile environment like an automated teller machine. And uh, because people have verified everything that's inside of it, uh, this is the only thing we trust, right? Uh, it didn't change the fact that there was a lot of components. Uh, uh, there's a lot of components inside of this, um, including the processors and the memory and all of that, and you have to trust that they were manufactured correctly. So this had limited usage, um, as I said, in ATMs. Uh, the different kind of approach was uh, processor agnostic or computing system agnostic almost, uh, where you said, well, I don't quite know what's happening with this Intel processor and what software is running on it. But if I kind of, at least maybe I can attest to the fact that a particular piece of hardware is being run that was, fabricate, that is, that was fabricated by Intel, and a particular operating system is running on that hardware. And I'm going to attest to that using this little chip called a TPM, which is a trusted platform module. And this little smart card chip that you could build for a buck is going to measure the environment, the hardware software environment that's running on this uh, processor that's agnostic to secure security. And then just kind of tell you that, well, Microsoft's, uh, I don't know, uh, version 42.1 uh, of the operating system was running on Intel hardware. And then now you basically trust Microsoft and Intel to have gotten it right. But at least you know that you're not running on some pirated version of, of, um, of the software. And so uh, TPMs are still around. Uh, they're in laptops. From what I can tell, uh, nobody really uses them for, uh, for anything, but, uh, but they're still out there on motherboards. So about 20 years ago, uh, I started working on this problem more than 20 years ago. Um, and um, we wanted to shrink the trusted computing base. So this slide is 21 years old. And so some of you 20-somethings in the audience, um, well, what's the giveaway here? There are many giveaways as to how old this slide is. Anybody? Yeah, back there. The icons, the, the, the CD, the CD. What about the CRT? You know, that's a CRT. 
Oh, by the way, yeah, so I, does everybody re recognize the CD-ROM, right? You guys recognize the CD-ROM, right? You know, that's like, I, yeah, I, have, I, I still have a, a thousand CDs, well, maybe not a thousand, but a few hundred CDs of music, but I don't have LPs in my, in my house, at least. Right? So yeah, so this is an old slide. It's, you know, somewhat relevant, still so, uh, uh, somewhat relevant. Um, and the idea is that you only trust a, a single chip, right? You only trust a single chip. Um, the chip has a secret key inside of it uh, that would allow it um, to authenticate itself to s someone else. So an Intel uh, a chip you would have a particular key, and you can use cryptography to authenticate remotely that it's an Intel chip. Um, and uh, it also is a way the secret key uh, could be used um, along with hashing to measure um, uh, the software that's running on it. And uh, you also do some um, refactoring of the software in the sense that you have this giant operating system that's millions of lines of code. And you say, I don't want to trust the entirety of the operating system. Uh, what I really want is um, the core functionality to be, we call it a security kernel back then, for want of a better term. But it's a much smaller piece of code that is going to essentially isolate um, a, a particular client from a the operating system or isolate different clients from each other. And uh, this security kernel is the only thing that you trust in the software, um, as opposed to um, the firmware and the BIOS and all of that. Um, and then one last thing uh, with respect to this picture, uh, or maybe not the last thing, but one other thing with respect to the picture is you don't want to trust anything that's outside of the chip. So we're trusting this single chip, and you don't want to trust the memory because someone could walk away with the memory. Um, and so you want to encrypt things that are in memory, so uh, using that key that's inside of the chip. And so if, if someone walked away with the memory, and the iPhones do it now, uh, you walked away with, uh, with the flash or, or, or uh, perhaps you know, walked away with the DRAM, you know, putting into into liquid nitrogen or something so the, so the uh, storage stayed for a while, uh, you wouldn't still lose your data. Uh, because it was encrypted and the key uh, isn't something that's accessible uh, to the person who walked away with it, the thief. Um, and then uh, the question is, uh, what about uh, someone who's watching um, the, the pins of the chip, right? So let's say that the chip is monolithic and you can't see inside of it, and it's kind of hard to imagine that you could do that you know, easily because it's a tiny little thing and the transistors are tiny, but s suppose someone could... Um, uh, get hold of this little device, and then they could tamper with the outside of the chip and look at the pins of the chip and, and uh, maybe actuate it or, or at least observe it. Um, can they see things that are coming out? And that's another reason for encryption. Um, but what about, what about patterns of um, memory access? Uh, um, the memory itself is uh, agnostic to security or, or um, the addresses that the memory is going to return data for they are not encrypted. The data may be encrypted, but the addresses aren't encrypted. So there's patterns of um, accesses that could leak information, and this is kind of getting towards side channels, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a, in a minute. Um, and so you want to protect that, right? And it turns out you could, you could use cryptography to encrypt the data going out. You could use um, cryptography to ensure that the data that you read in hasn't been replayed. Uh, you could use cryptography to obfuscate the address patterns that are going out of the chip to make sure that they don't leak. And we kind of did all of that uh, way back when. And uh, the last thing, this is the last thing, uh, actually not the last thing because I added one more bullet you know, just a minute ago. Uh, but the operating system isn't, isn't trusted and you only trust the security kernel. And all of this um, works well if you have a single process, right? It's, uh, so this is the one thing that we missed way back when, which was, um, Oh, great. It would be nice to have this trusted computing base uh, that's minimal security kernel and just the chip. Uh, you don't have to trust the operating system. And we took care of all of these uh, external side channels, uh, as I said. But uh, if you have multiple processes, it turns out, and this came out really in the last uh, few years, um, maybe uh, the word side channel existed before, but microarchitectural side channels are things that we completely missed which was the fact that most machines have many clients, many processes running inside of them. And there's a lot of sharing that goes on inside of a processor. 
and um, for example, the DRAM um, is being shared, but the cache inside of the processor is shared, um, the CPUs are shared, the cores are shared, et cetera, and there's a whole host of problems that comes out with respect to, let's say, the untrusted operating system snooping on a particular process, and you, uh, therefore trust is broken because the operating system, which is untrusted, gets to see the private data that's on the chip in a decrypted fashion uh, be because it's stored inside of the cache you know, using these microarchitectural side channels. So um, a few years ago, we decided to revisit this. And so this is just an example of you have a cache and uh, you're, you're using, it's basically a hash function. You're using um, different uh, sets in the cache to store data from different processes. And one process could uh, uh, watch what's going on based on the hit rates and the miss rates associated with the cache. You could actually leak, leak data, right? And there's others that I'll mention as I go along. Um, and so shifted gears about 10 years ago to think about things that are stronger than processes. So process isolation is important. It's central to time sharing. It's central to everything that we do on the cloud or on our laptops. Uh, but this notion of an enclave is something that's uh, stronger than a process. It gives you a stronger isolation guarantee where it says um, that um, regardless of all of these side channels that I've talked about, um, and I haven't really enumerated them, but you can think of the cache as being the prim primary side channel. Uh, we want uh, these enclaves to be resistant to these side channel attacks, and things that are inside of an enclave can't be seen, can't be observed by um, the operating system or uh, attack uh, programs that are running inside of other enclaves on the same machine, co-resident on the same chip. Um, and so. You just don't, isolation of memory, the DRAM external memory is one thing, but you want much more. So you want the stronger guarantee that I just uh, talked about. Um, one thing that has come up certainly in Adam's talk and it comes up when you use cryptography is what is the overhead of cryptography? And um, enclaves are nice in this way. Think of it as sort of a, you know, you have this fort and you have a, a moat around the, the fort or the castle and you have a drawbridge and uh, the en enclaves are things that say, well, in order to get in, you have to do a bunch of work. You know, you got to put down the drawbridge and you got to cross the moat, um, and then uh, you pull up the drawbridge again, and that is going to take a while. But when you're in the castle, I mean, you're you're in a trusted environment, and and you can essentially do things uh, in a very uh, performant manner. And so there's um, entry and exit costs, but uh, you hopefully get performance. And you're running basically with no overhead you know, inside of the enclave. And so the overheads um, uh, are associated with entry and exit. Right? So that's the, what I meant here by decoupling performance considerations from security. You have to build enclaves. And the question is, well, you do have to change the hardware if you want performance. And you'd like this to be minimal. And um, at, when I say provable security here, I, I, there's obviously a proving cryptography being secure, but I meant more in terms of the isolation guarantees that you have. And these are, uh, are proofs that are closer to what um, Adam talked about um, in the sense that uh, you're guaranteeing that the particular implementation um, ha satisfies certain isolation properties that uh, you can't touch this memory location because the hardware is built correctly, et cetera. Right? So all of those things are context. And um, this is basically what an enclave lifecycle looks like. And I gave you the mode drawbridge analogy. But the idea is that you set things up, you do a measurement, so you create the enclave, grant resources, load the enclave, and seal it, which means that you can't change it anymore, and then you have this measurement. After that is when a client is going to send their data into the enclave in, uh, in an encrypted fashion, so think of it as SSLing uh, a, a secure connection to inside of the enclave. Um, and the enclave can no longer be modified, so you know that uh, you have a trusted environment inside, and then you run in this strongly isolated environment, and, and then when you're done, you exit the enclave, right? Um, this is a little bit simplistic because you may be interacting with the external world, and so things get a little bit more complicated, and there's performance issues associated with that. I'll get into it a little bit, but not a whole lot, since this is supposed to be an overview talk. Um, so. Um, at some level, the isolation property um, can be described in a very simple way, which is you have a privileged attacker uh, running on the same machine as the victim, um, and um, you want to make sure that uh, the isolation property is such that 
um, any attack uh, that uh, could be run um, on the uh, on a, on a, on a d different machine, uh, you know, would work on the. Uh, uh, there, there's an equivalence between being resident on the machine and being uh, separated uh, in on a different machine. So so being on the same machine doesn't help you. Um, maybe a simpler way of thinking about it is that the enclave itself could leak its secrets by printing its secret onto standard out, but that would be the only break. Um, you'd, uh, you, you would not be breaking because of uh, side channels or because of isolation being broken uh, by the operating system. And so there's uh, three basic mechanisms of doing isolation. One is, well, use different rooms. You know, people in different rooms can't hear each other because of the walls, that's spatial isolation. Or use temporal isolation, which is only one person or a collection of trusted people use a room at the same time, and then when they leave the room, you know, they, 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 they um, uh, disinfect the room, um, and then the next set of people doesn't have anything to look at because the room has been disinfected. Um, or you could use encryption and cryptography. Right? So those are the three mechanisms. And so we built a sequence of processors um, I, I, using these mechanisms of isolation, and I'll just run through a, a, a couple of these. You know, the, uh, uh, an early one, um, not the earliest one that you saw a picture of, but this was uh, built about, about 10 years ago. And by built, I mean running on a field programmable gate array, not a custom chip. And so this is a RISC-V processor that looks like that. This is something that you would learn about in an undergraduate uh, computer architecture class. It's got um, caches and cores, um, and it doesn't have uh, concomitant execution using uh, hyperthreading, and doesn't have speculation. I'll say a little bit more about that as I go along. Um, and so um, one of the things that you have to worry about if you don't trust the operating system is the fact that the operating system is doing a lot of resource management for you, and you have virtual memory because um, you want virtual memory because of process isolation and for convenience of programming and time sharing, and the operating system manages the page tables. And I should say, by the way, that um, one of the commercial instantiations of the single chip secure processor was uh, Intel's um, uh, uh, Skylake processor that has this thing called Intel SGX, which stands for Software Guard Extensions. And they had the similar model of an untrusted operating system and only trusting the hardware and a secret key inside of it. And uh, one of the mistakes that they made was um, uh, uh, not uh, taking into account the fact that the operating system manages the page tables. And it turns out that uh, because of this uh, design flaw, um, you could actually attack uh, Intel SGX and essentially um, leak secrets from it. So if you were had the secret Rubik's Cube um, image inside of an enclave, by having the operating system mess with the page table entries corresponding to each of the enclave processes, um, you could um, make the memory access requests um, such that someone who's, uh, the operating system can monitor um, memory accesses that are going off the chip and using uh, the combination of uh, corrupting the page tables uh, by the privileged attacker, the operating system, and monitoring the memory uh, uh, accesses, you could figure out uh, that um, the image that was being uh, worked on inside of the enclave, which presumably had to be secret, was the image down at the bottom, when in reality it was the image up top, which is clearly a break. Right? So, so one of the things that um, we had to do when we built our processor was to change um, the, the actual design to be such that enclaves manage their own page tables. And so if you had a couple of enclaves, then the enclave memory that's untouchable by the operating system stores the page table entries. So this is just a little tidbit to give you a sense of the changes that you have to make if you want to go from processes to enclaves. And I mentioned uh, um, uh, side channel attacks. And now we knew about side channels when we built Sanctum. And so we wanted to take into account all of the side channels that were inside of the hardware. And the primary one is the cache side channel. And you can solve that you know, fairly simply by essentially saying, we're going to use spatial isolation and have different sets of the cache being assigned to different enclaves so the operating system doesn't get to access the set corresponding to a particular enclave. And you could use page coloring to do that. Um, and so that's an example of spatial isolation. And so uh, this is the picture of a RISC-V core. Uh, you don't want to take much away from it other than the fact that where you see the colors, 
are things where the interfaces change a little bit, and you see a little bit of blue where there's some extra logic associated with doing the couple of changes that I just described to you. And so that was pretty much it. And so we said, this is, uh, if you were believed our uh, analysis, and this wasn't done in an automated fashion, this would be a, a provably secure processor or an arguably secure processor that is resistant to the side channels uh, that correspond to, uh, uh, to this processor uh, because we enumerated all of them. Um, and uh, you, know, you don't trust the operating system, yada, yada, yada. Right? And then you know, we were pretty happy about this. And then we had you know, a, a, a blow up, if you will, with respect to um, what happens when you have more complicated processors, which do speculation. Um, and uh, uh, you have the notion of uh, uh, let's not necessarily do the next instruction in our pipeline, but let's pretend that we know um, what instruction we might be executing even though there's a branch coming up and I don't quite know which way I'm going to go. Uh, it could be the if, uh, the then branch or the else branch, and I'm going to pretend that I know uh, and I'm going to go left, uh, and it might be the case that I mispredicted and I actually had to go right, but then I'll flush the pipeline, yada, 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 or I'll do things out of order and so on and so forth. So there's a huge number of microarchitectural op uh, optimizations that have been uh, put into processors over the last 30 years, including speculation, out of order execution, branch prediction, and so on. And Sanctum, that processor I showed you, had none of these things. It was a very simple undergraduate uh, student uh, you know, level or undergraduate class level processor. But other processors are much more complicated and have speculation. And then, as I said, the world blew up because of uh, specter attacks and meltdown attacks, where people realized that um, the more complicated processors, including the Intel SGXs of the world, were susceptible to their enclaves being attacked by these more complicated um, uh, 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 microarchitectural attacks. So, so at that point, we said, well, gee, now I've got to go back to the drawing board. Uh, let's go to the graduate class uh, processor, which was this risky OO that I showed you. Um, and uh, you know, that's the picture that I showed you, and it's got uh, renamed tables and speculation managers and epoch managers on the left, way more complicated, you know, a factor of order of magnitude more complicated than the simple um, 6004 level processor that you know, some of you um, uh, kids might have, um, might have looked at, uh, or the RISC V processor. And um, it turns out you know, there's a reason this processor is really complicated, and you can kind of see uh, the reason on the slide, which is um, all of these things give you, uh, for the same clock speed, give you a factor of three on average, and sometimes even a factor of 10 improvement in performance. Right? And so performance is the name of the game. Uh, we want more performance, and there's more microarchitectural complexity associated with this performance. And unfortunately, there's way more complexity associated with all of the microarchitectural side channels. So our goal was to take this processor and build a processor that would be secure against microarchitectural uh, side channel attacks. And so we went off and we, uh, we've done a, a couple of more. This is more recent work. And so what happens with the enclave life cycle? You don't want to turn off speculation, because if you turn off speculation, you lose a huge amount of performance. So you could say, well, I'm just going to turn off all of these optimizations, but uh, that's going back to this old processor. Um, so the nice thing about enclaves and this more drawbridge model is that you can set things up so you don't um, speculate during the transitions, and you have to be really careful, uh, but you can't speculate inside of an enclave. And you'll just have to take my word for it that uh, you could do this and build this in such a way that you don't lose performance inside of an enclave, you only lose performance in the transitions, and you've got to be pretty careful and you've got to make a lot more hardware changes. Um, and so um, the overheads really are it, on the small side, um, well, especially if you compare to FHE, right? Sorry, Vinod. Um, and uh, you, know, you have a performance overhead of in and out. You know, every time you go in and out, uh, the times that you do for a, uh, for, when running a program, you know, it's a few percent overall. Um, because you do the flushing, you have to clean up your state, disinfect the room when you leave the room, as I mentioned before. You have to do the spatial partitioning, which is another few percent. Um, and uh, this is important. I, in order to actually talk to the outside world, you have to do some sharing. You've got to share data. You have memory, the DRAM that's shared by anybody and everybody, including the operating system. You have to be really careful when you 
speculatively access shared memory because the bad people could be watching you and, and mispredictions could, could cause trouble. And here you have to change the memory pipeline such that you don't speculatively access shared memory, but you wait long enough and you do a little bit of stalling, and so the overhead for that isn't, isn't that much. And the area overheads um, are not that large either. And then the nice thing about this is that the overall hardware software co-design as associated with the security monitor um, and the security kernel, we changed the word for it, but the factoring where you, you only verif uh, you trust 10,000 lines of code as opposed to a million lines of code stayed the same. Um, the transitions are what is important, um, not uh, uh, outside of the enclave, you don't care, it's insecure. Inside of the enclave, if you've gotten the transitions right, it's going to be uh, private and, uh, and have integrity. So there's a few challenges. The performance is not the biggest challenge. Expressivity is, is a big challenge. You do want to interact with the external world. That causes problems. I mentioned a couple of things that you could do. Uh, but other challenges are you know, what happens if you want more resources? Things are very static in the world that I described to you. Um, you get to use this set of the cache or one half of the cache. The operating system uses the other half. What if you wanted more? Well, you've got to be careful with leaking information if you ask for more resources. And perhaps crypto can help here. And certainly people have uh, looked into it. So um, it'd be nice to do this dynamic allocation to get back more performance. Um, and as I mentioned, um, if you have really interactive applications, you got a, you got a big problem. So um, a few open problems. But let me close with saying, um, what, what would I like? You know, what would make me really happy? I'd like an open source uh, single chip secure processor with a formally verified trusted computing base that's small, um, you know, secure against all known attacks. Um, and it'd be nice to have physical security. That, that's probably pretty hard to do, uh, but uh, at least enhance physical security and obviously minimal performance overhead. And I actually think you know, we're getting closer and closer to um, this, uh, these desiderata. Right. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Thanks.